and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Sirabao Sage, Korean Foundation Postdoctoral Fellow in the University of British Columbia. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce Dr. Sage. Personally, Dr. Sage used to be my close colleague when I was a research professor of Korea University two years ago. I can't forget the first moment when I met her. One day, while I was in the office, I could hear her cheerful steps from the corridor so I could sense her energetic attitude toward all of the all kinds of social and academic barriers. Tonight, I'm so pleased to have her as the lecturer of Sokietas Koreana. We can expect her energetic lecture as much as her personality. She was great, graduated from University of California, Los Angeles in two, uh, 2012. And after that, she became a PhD holder in the field of culture and performance. She has lots of work experiences and publications about this field. Um, I believe we are in for a real treat tonight. Now, please welcome Dr. Asira Bausic with a warm round of applause. bodies on stages in Korea. So I'm specifically looking at dance. You might be wondering, somebody who does research on performance, why would I focus on dance? Obviously, the limitations as you get older are very different when you're dancing than when you're singing or when you're playing an instrument. So I, at this point, I'm just focusing on this sort of physical embodiment and the complications that you get as you get older. So I've got three basic sections there, and on, if we have time, a little discussion at the end. So, my vignette. On June 19th, 2011, I attended CHU, this is the poster, a gala performance in the prestigious large hall of the National Gokak Center. I arrived early in order to meet dance scholar Che Hei Di. She explained about her research, and we had this whole great conversation, countless questions about dance in contemporary Korea. And as I was scribbling notes, occasionally I would look up in the, in the lobby there, next to these gigantic painted uh, barrel drums, were gathering an increasingly large crowd of uh, attendees. <laughs> I recognized many of these audience members. There were cultural policy makers, uh, officials at the, at the um, Cultural Heritage uh, Administration of Korea. There were professors who do research on the performing arts. There were performers who do other arts or even other uh, dancers. So this was a huge event. This was basically the performance event of the season. Audience members were attracted by the rare chance to see two extremely elderly dancers. Jang Gundo, born in 1928, and Joe Gangnyeok, born in 1923. They were extensively promoted in the advertisements for the show. On <laughs> so they're extensively promoted in the advertisements for the show. And the advertising language made it clear that these two elderly women represented the authentic embodiment of Korean dance. That this was a rare and precious opportunity to see real Korean dance, or chu. So the name of the performance was chu, and dance is also chu. So that evening, from my cheap third floor balcony seat, 
I watched artistic director Jin Oksa's eight carefully chosen dancers move across the wide expanse of the National Gukak Center stage, alone but for the musicians lining the right-hand side of the stage. I was thrilled by Lee Jung Hee's Do Sa Puri Chun and inspired by Kim and Tae's Chaesan Sogo Chun. Yet the highlight of the evening was meant to be the performances by John and Joe, which posed complex and conflicting responses. Joe danced uncertainly for less than two minutes before she made a move to leave the stage. Jin Ok Sok, emceeing the performance and in the wings at that moment, was caught between his humility in front of this very elderly and widely respected dancer and the pressure to provide an acceptable evening of entertainment for a sold out house. So he stopped her and raised his arms and tried to encourage her to dance some more by dancing opposite her. And then uh, suddenly, Jin's friend, the crossover artist Zhang Saik, appeared out of the wings, grabbed uh, the guengani, the small gong from the, one of the musicians, and started playing guengani with this old woman. She danced for another 45 seconds tentatively, and then finally was rescued by one of her younger, presumably female relatives, or one of her students, um, and, uh, and finally left the stage. So that's, that's kind of where I started with this, this extreme elderly in the performance environment and what that means. That's the other side of the program. So this vignette demonstrates the staging of the elderly that's visible in the traditional arts in the Republic of Korea. So studies of dance can actually reveal socio-cultural truths about the society in which they emerge, and we can see something about the beliefs in Korea. We all know Koreans have you know, tremendous respect for age, so that's definitely part of what's going on here. But on specifically in, in this uh, emerging article, I'm writing about how and why dancers who are quite elderly, who may be having you know, movement difficulties, continue to be pushed onto the stage, and what reasons there are for this to happen. Um, so uh, this situation with these dancers, born in 1923 and 1928, going up on stage, is in sharp contrast with what we see in most other countries in the world. Uh, generally, the elderly are absent from the dance stage. And they're even absent from discussion of dance. There's no praise for advanced age, only for youth. Oh, oh look, only 14 years old, already this good. We always hear praise for youth in discussions of dance in the Western world. Um, age is only discussed uh, in terms of um, <laughs> the extent of emphasizing the use of a dancer, and it's not discussed in terms of bringing experience or maturity. In scholarship, age and dance basically only comes together when people want to talk about, usually people in the medical field, who want to talk about the benefit of dance for physical and mental health of older individuals. And they say, oh, this is a great thing for you know, retirees to get involved with. Moving your body, getting outside of the home, this has wonderful health benefits. Um, but in most types of dance outside of Korea, dancers are under 35 years, or outside of uh, Asia, uh, dancers are under 35 years old. The field is dominated by young artists. Dancers are on stage to please the eye, and often even recruitment comes down to um, conventional beauty, as well as talent in movement form. And um, so we see uh, in so many descriptions of the Western dancer that we need to have a, quote, gendered ideal of a graceful, youthful, 
beautiful dancing body. That is the body that we want to see on the Western stage. Um, there has been research recently into the post-retirement life, particularly of ballet dancers, especially the most elite dancers who've spent so much of their life, their identity is so closely tied up with being a ballet dancer, with being someone who can move. And maybe they've been learning ballet since they were six or eight or whatever years old, and then they retire. And they're often retiring on the different studies that I've looked at, average age of 31, early 30s, mid 30s. These are the numbers that they keep saying. And in fact, if we look at ballet research and we go back a few decades, on a few decades ago, it was common to see ballet dancers on the stage into their 60s. But the ballet body has changed. The ballet body has become thinner and more elongated, and the dance, the dance motions have become more athletic. And what this has done is it has pushed the average age of dancers younger and younger. And you see, the, especially with the more prestigious companies, you see dancers being pushed to retire as soon as they hit what is perceived as the peak of their career. Because after you've been a soloist, do you really want to go back to just being in the background? So they try to push them into something. So that's what's happening outside of Korea or outside of traditional dance in Asia. Now, traditional dance in Asia, you know, the Korean situation is not completely unique. But as I'm going to explain, the Korean situation is complicated by Korean heritage policy, which further promotes elderly dancing bodies. So obviously, I'm completely forgetting to read my paper on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Maybe I'll get to everything, and maybe I'll skip too much. Um, so, uh, Korean scholars of performance find the participation of older performers unremarkable. This is actually something that Korean scholars haven't really addressed. They haven't specifically addressed the fact that we are now seeing people that 10 years ago or 20 years ago were fabulous and now they're still on the stage and they're not so fabulous anymore. But it feels almost like a betrayal to talk about that in scholarship. And so we don't actually see a lot of research happening on, on this topic. And so I guess that's my job as a foreigner, as somebody coming from outside, as somebody who, you know, isn't, I guess, super close to some of these people that maybe I can talk about this. Um, I don't know, maybe I can't, maybe it'll come back to bite me, that I shouldn't have challenged uh, the, the staging of some of these elderly dancers. Um, so after the Japanese colonial period, traditional knowledge was almost always held by older individuals, because these were the individuals uh, that had learned you know, in the authentic you know, pre-colonial era. And these individuals were celebrated in the media. Um, the, the classic case that we always talk about is um, we had Ye Yong-hae. He started publishing these articles in the newspaper. They were all collected together as a, a book called Kingdom Dan Mun that came out in 1997. But this series of articles that he started writing in the early 60s, if I'm remembering correctly, and talking about these elderly performers, elderly craftspeople, and the things that, that they had to teach us. Um, but even before Ye's articles, uh, from the salvage anthropology influenced beginnings of folklore research in Korea, elderly practitioners have been understood to hold the most authentic knowledge of traditional arts because their training and development of the art was influenced less by the Japanese occupation. So although folklore research and the certification of items of Korean intangible cultural heritage discuss age of interviewees and practitioners, the extreme visibility of age in the performance environment and the window that this provides to understand the ramifications of cultural policy on the performing arts has been largely ignored. So in this article, I will explain the staging of the elderly in the context of cultural heritage uh, protection. Um, 
long-standing ideas about performance transmission in Korea, Korean aesthetics, and nostalgia for an authentic pre-modern era. Yeah, I thought you could get bored of that last night. Um, so, age and the Republic of Korea. The complex overlap of age and the performing arts is naturally connected to attitudes towards age in Korea in general. So, in some societies, older people are respected because they have more skills, knowledge, property, civil and political power. In other societies, as older people no longer contribute uh, to economic success and they turn over resource control to younger people, then they become increasingly marginalized. Social values deeply embedded in Korean society have provided a very strong moral imperative for respectful treatment of the elderly. Yet the position of the elderly in modern Korean society continues to change. Until the rural to urban shift, grandparents were the primary caregivers in Korea. And after the shift, mothers took over a lot of that child rearing. But in contemporary Korea, now we've got both parents working. We've got a, a fertility rate that's 1.2 or lower, um, obviously far below replacement. And because we have so few children being born, the burden on Korean children for elder care is increasing. These small nuclear families with, who are living in space-precious urban apartments no longer feel the advantages of a three-generation household that their own grandparents felt. So, the status of the elderly is basically vulnerable as society modernizes. We've seen that around the world. And we're seeing that in, in Korea as well. Research on the aging and the aging in Korea has revealed a rapid increase in senior living facilities, stress on family members who are responsible for elder care, and instances of callous treatment of elderly relatives. So in this society, <coughs> in which the elderly are increasingly less involved, a society in which filial piety is said to be eroding, traditional performers, elderly traditional performers, are being accorded great respect and frequently appear on stage. So it's a little bit the opposite of what's happening in society overall. Society overall is getting harder and harder for elderly people in Korea. We have the highest rate of elderly poverty in the OECD. Uh, it's, but in Korean performance, the oldest and most experienced performer will frequently be the star. Uh, they're drawing the audience, they're providing focus for any media coverage, they're receiving, receiving adoring standing ovations, an entire evening with seven to nine dancers, like the tune performance, you saw all of them on that poster, can be performed with dancers with an average age in the upper 70s. Participation in prestigious performance series at prestigious halls, or even launching a solo ticketed show for a dancer in Korea is extremely rare before the age of 40 in the traditional arts. I'm sure it's totally different in ballet, but I'm talking about the traditional arts here. In some cases, however, these performers are continuing far past the apex of their ability. I'm providing the following descriptions of elderly performers I've seen, most of them highly ranked within national, provincial, or city level policy instruments for protecting intangible cultural heritage. I've seen performances by dancers so infirm, I was afraid that when the choreography required them to kneel down, that they would not be able to get back up again at the right place in the music. I have seen dancers who push themselves off the stage floor using the hand drum and the drumstick that they had knelt down to retrieve. I've seen them quivering and shaking 
when the choreography dictates that they balance on one foot. I've seen their hands visibly shaking. I've seen them walk out onto the stage with a cane, put it down, dance, and then pick it back up to walk off the stage. I've seen them led onto the stage by their students or relatives, uh, and I've seen them abridge a dance, because the choreography for these traditional dances, I mean, we know it pretty well. I've seen them abridge dances significantly, half of the, the period or more, gone, in order to have enough energy to have a finish at all. The most profound example that I saw was a performance by a dancer so beset by osteoporosis that she was bent over with a huge hump on her back. Yet her performance was so good. Her corporeal movements were totally hampered by the osteoporosis. The osteoporosis was dictating some of what she could and could not do. But the energy and the desire with which she danced was astounding. So that's, that is like the key reason, the key reason why people continue to take the, to try to push these people out there. Because when it's good, it's so good. Even with osteoporosis, even with a cane. So there's actually this tension between skill and age that is permeating the core of the traditional performing arts scene in Korea. So we have these intertwined reasons why the elderly can be found on Korean stages performing even after they start to experience this erosion of physical ability. The idea that learning is never done is basically the key ideology of the Korean traditional performing arts training process. And it basically pushes the preeminence of age within the performing arts. So to illustrate this, I have this, um, it's a little bit from an interview that I was doing with one of my teachers. And so she explains to me, you know, she's been dancing her whole life since she was a little kid. And she says, and she's very widely respected, although I may still need to work on my skills, this is what I'm doing with my life. I need to keep learning throughout the rest of my life continuously. And I asked her, when are you going to get a higher rank? I'm going to explain more about the ranks later, but <laughs> when are you going to get a higher rank? And she says, oh, there's a test to advance. And maybe she'll take it when she's in her late 50s or her early 60s. Now, she was in her early 50s at this point. Yeah, I think I should be better by that age. So you have a person who's been dancing since she was six years old, who tells you she's continuously learning, who says, maybe I'll be better later on. I need to practice more. There are still so many ways in which I am lacking. And compared to the teacher, I'm still young, right? So here's this woman in her early 50s, and she is explaining just how important in the Korean traditional performance environment an attitude of learning is never done is. Because if, I guess I don't really remember that yet, I'll that. Um, if you don't have this attitude that learning is never done, um, how do you cope with the fact that you've been learning something for 20, 30, 40, 50 years and you're still not the top? Like you have to have, this is, this is the ideology that can keep you going. Um, as long as everyone agrees with the principle that learning is never done, the participation of older performers becomes less remarkable. Oh, they are also still learning. And their students, even if the students are only a little younger than them, they, students also still need a teacher. They still need to learn. So in a case like Kim and Ju, this woman Kim and Ju, um, although she's well known in the community of performance professionals as highly skilled, she humbly comments on her own deficiencies and expresses gratitude for study opportunities. 
in the Korean traditional performing arts until one attains that top rank on, again, I am going to explain about the ranks, even a teacher still has to maintain the humility that they themselves are also still learning. And this isn't just a performance for her. I mean, she's, I, I've, I've learned from her. She's one of my primary teachers, and I think I've been in her classes for about five years, all told. And trust me, she, this is, it's not a performance of humility, it's real humility. She really believes that she still has something to learn. So this maxim that learning is never done actually appears repeatedly in my ethnographic research. Uh, it's not always as explicit as Kim and Ju's statement in this interview, but this pedagogical concept basically frames the way in which performances are taught and how the arts are performed. And this totally flies in the face of this whole, you know, Korean bali bali, you know, quickly, quickly quality of modern life. It's like the absolute opposite. Uh, and it always cracks me up when you see the narratives about the K-pop stars, and they're like, oh, they trained so hard. They trained for three years before debut. And I'm like, oh, come on, three years, what? Yeah. So, but uh, anyway, on um, teachers of the performing arts, they are deploying a concept like learning is never done to motivate their students, to motivate them through the struggle to attain difficult skills. On um, because it, if you can't motivate them, then this continuous learning thing can seem like a real potential barrier, because outside the traditional performing arts. I think all over the world, outside the traditional arts, on um, devotion to lifelong learning is really disappearing. Everybody wants to just learn it fast. They want an app. Isn't there an app for that? They don't want to spend their whole life on something. On um, participation in contemporary arts is associated with a clearer and faster payoff. You can learn for a shorter time, achieve your talent, get on stage, it'll work out. The time commitment devoted to rising in the ranks in traditional arts is significant, and it requires giving up any cynical questioning of how much time is really needed. Because oftentimes, some people learn faster than others. Not everybody needs all this time. But the system really prioritizes, when did you start learning? Oh, you started learning in 2002? Okay. Uh, the system doesn't say, oh, you're learning faster, or you're more talented. Uh, when did you start? So this learning is never done. It also counteracts egotistical desires to be um, you know, famous. Uh, and although there is an audience that's eager to see specific individuals perform in well well-promoted events like Chum, like the, the concert I started with. In general, artists in the field of traditional arts in Korea do not receive widespread individual recognition. Uh, most Koreans have no idea who their names are. Uh, you know, Western arts have soloists, they have headliners. These Korean arts, especially group arts, everybody's treated the same. You never hear something like, oh, uh, tonight we're going to have a performance of Bong San Tal Chim with Chi Bali is going to be performed by so and so. We never hear that. The performance of Bong San Tal Chim never foregrounds the one guy who is going to do the one part tonight. But, you know, any time that Joe Sumi is performing in some opera, of course they're saying, like, and the part of whatever is a soprano part in opera, I should have prepared that. Uh, anyway, that soprano being sung by Joseph B. Everybody will know that she is doing that particular part. But in these Korean arts, especially the group arts, you don't get that. So Koreans today, they know a few names of traditional artists. So they might know, um, well, Yi Mei Bong is passed on now, but they, many people know that name. They may know An Suk Sun. She's um, a very famous uh, Gayodam Byeongchang. Uh, performer, which means that she does diagram and she sings constantly. Um, and uh, they know Kim Duk Su. Uh, that's about it. That's about the end of their list of traditional performers. 
So this learning is never done thing is one of the ways that you can say like, well, all of us are still learning. None of us are the headliner. None of us are the, the star. So on cultural heritage policies in Korea, on, actually if I just ignore this thing and just talk off this, on the cultural property protection law was passed in 1962, on, and that protected intangible cultural heritage until March of 2016, and then we get this new law called the Intangible <coughs> Cultural Heritage Safeguarding and Promotion Law. And so we basically take intangible cultural heritage out of this larger law and we put it off in its own law, which will better reflect the fact that protecting intangible heritage, like dance, is a bit different than protecting tangible heritage like palaces. So they've done, they've separated this off in, in this way. On
transcend the individual as it becomes the possession of the Korean Cultural Heritage Administration. Some say that a system like this objectifies artists, particularly the people at the top, the national human treasures, who lose some of their personhood to being national human treasures. This is, this is now their identity. They have a, a role to perform for the nation on a duty to do this, even though they are at an age when most people retire. So, as a general rule, national human treasures they used to have a law, in, inside of the law, it used to say they had to be 60, but then they realized that wasn't actually right, because you have people who do things like uh, uh, tightrope. Have you ever seen a Korean performance of tightrope? They're like jumping up and down. It's not tightrope like I'm walking. It's tightrope, this very, very aggressive, jumping up and down on this rope and doing flips and all this stuff. And so, you really can't be a national human treasure at 60 years old and be doing tightrope. And we do have a guy now who's into his 50s, he's still doing it, I'm wondering, maybe he, maybe his body can keep going. But some of these arts just become really, really difficult the older you get. So they got rid of the 60 thing. But in general, you still find that almost all of the national human treasures are more than 60. Um, I don't have it in these notes, I have it in something else that I'm writing. But um, I actually have the numbers all crunched for the average age. And the average age of the National Home Treasures is somewhere like around 69 or something. Um, so if you can imagine, you get to be this National Human Treasure and all of your friends have already retired from their jobs. But now you're the center of attention more than you ever were before. <clears throat> now you're the dancer that is most called upon to be on stage because now you're the top. Um, so, uh, wow, I'm really just not, I'm really jet lagged. That's part of the reason I'm just talking like this. So, um, but placing just one or two performers at the top really has changed transmission practices a lot. Because basically what we have is we have a situation where you need to be nominated to be in to advance. Somebody has to nominate you to take that exam, to move up in the ranks. And the only person that can nominate you is somebody that's way up in the top of this system. So you need to have a teacher, learning is never done, you need to have a teacher that you are continuing to have a good relationship with, who is continuing to see you doing things for them, showing up for them, you know, being there for them, helping them teach classes, all of that kind of stuff. You need to have that teacher liking you, or you will not be nominated to move up in this system. So it also has this very, um, it has a very controlling impact on transmission. So if you want to learn this art, you are no longer just going to whoever you feel can teach you the best. You are going to the person who has the power to nominate you. So the person that you're going to go to, if you care to rise in this system, the person that you're going to go to is going to be highly ranked in this system. You're not going to go to somebody else who has amazing skills, who didn't care about it. And a lot of the people within this thing, there's a lot of politics involved. There's a lot of um, issues. For example, if you take some time off, like you get married and you have kids, and anyway, you put your dance career on hold, and then you come back. Well, you want to say, oh, I started in 2000. But the other people, they want to say, oh, you've only learned for 10 years. You know? because. Everybody's vying with each other to move up in these ranks. And so it creates a sort of uh, competitive, claustrophobic sort of situation because this system is the only way to get up. And you can get stipends from on the teacher rank, Jansu Kyo Yo, and the National Human Treasures. They get stipends. They're not that much. But on when you're a person who has been devoting yourself to arts your whole life, um, it's nice to have a regular income. Because, you know, performance fees, they come and they go. Some, some months you have it, some months you don't. In Korea, we have a lot of performances in the spring and the fall. 
not so many in the summer or the winter. People don't want to leave the house so much. The weather's bad. You know, so we have a lot of performances happening just two times a year. And so when people start to actually get these stipends, it really matters to them. So I'm, so I'm somewhere in here, I'm sure. Um, so these cultural policies play a significant role in the staging of the elderly. By, labing, by labeling a performer a national human treasure, their performance has added legitimacy. It has added value. And the artist is more of a star or more of a brand compared to elderly performers who don't have that rank yet. So this title essentially provides increased opportunities to perform. As soon as you get one of these more advanced titles, then you're more rare, you're more special. Um, and um, even if you have gone past your peak, the effect of the law on the audience is powerful. Because um, this is actually, I, I have a publication on this that came out last year, but audience knowledge of the traditional performing arts and the, audience's mem the audience member's ability to judge uh, what they're watching has actually decreased in Korea because people just aren't familiar enough with traditional arts. So they, they really trust these ranks. They see a rank and they say, oh, okay. They must be the best. They must be good. And they accept this judgment, which has come from this system, as being a very strong legitimizing force. So um, since audiences defer to these rank titles and consider them certificates of ability, even though they aren't really, they're more like certificates of, I kept doing it for a very long time and didn't make anybody angry and managed to keep going. But audiences react to these as being a certificate of ability. So then the performers, the promoters, the venue staff, they respond to the audience and then they try to get more and more of the higher ranked performers, foregrounding their ranks in promotions for the shows. Um, National Human Treasures almost always have the first right of refusal. If you are going to have a performance and you want to have somebody do sumu, well, if you're a big venue, you're going to call the National Human Treasure first. If that person says, no, I'm busy on that day, then you start going down. So they have a right of first refusal. But um, unsurprisingly, the National Human Treasures are on, oh, sorry, I didn't want to get a little bit unsurprising sentence. Okay. <laughs> Um, so they have the first right of refusal on, and so this also helps them to get on the stage quite often. So it's part of, oh, I think I'm just going to skip that. It's part of a pressure on the elderly to continue to perform. So let's look at this from the perspective of the elderly dancer. Right? So lifelong, heritage, lifelong learning, heritage policy, all of that kind of fosters a situation where the older artist can find it difficult to avoid the stage. Um, but there is some other stuff going on too. First, in almost every conversation with elderly performers or with younger performers, um, the desire to perform was first and often the only reason that was given for elderly performers' continued involvement. So, you know, I mean, this is what elderly performers say. They say, I'm gonna keep doing it until I can't do it anymore, until I can't move anymore. And it's also what the younger people say about their, their teachers. Um, this is certainly the case for Yi Mei Bong, um, the most famous solo dancer in Korea, who until his death was the national human treasure of both Sungwoo and Salkuri, which is actually pretty unusual. Usually you're um, within the heritage system for only one art, but he managed to hold on to national human treasure position in two different arts. Um, he was still headlining solo shows in December of 2010, already in his 90s. Um, so when I went to that show, in December of 2010, 
there's this 22 page glossy program on full of all these photos of his illustrious career. And the large hall was sold out again, of course, because everybody wants to come for the most famous performer. Um, but four days later, I went back and I was talking to Kim and Jim, my teacher, the one we interviewed before, and I asked her about Imeba and about him still being on stage at 90 plus. And I, she said that his performances uh, had been so beautiful in the past that they had been able to move the watcher to tears. Um, unmatched. But when I saw that performance in 2010, what I saw was a painful mixture of seeing an elderly dancer that had been so important still on the stage when he shouldn't be because his skills were no longer clearly, he was clearly declining. And um, I also saw a, a flagrant display of, of ego. So um, I actually want to show you guys, this is actually not 2010, this is 2012. Yimei Bong, I'm still performing in 2012. Uh, so I think this will give you guys an idea of what I'm talking about, these elderly performers with the uh, declining ability. And you can see how he still is so good, still so good, but you can also see the age. You can clearly see the age.
time, but I think you guys can see, like, this is a really old person dancing. I mean, still, he still knows the choreography. Obviously, he's still mentally there with this choreography. But we're also seeing a performance of extreme age. And it is a bridge, you know, he doesn't uh, go all the way through the choreography. I don't think they can plan for him to do it. Um, and then a, a, one of his uh, primary students comes out and does a, a full length one. But um, anyway, so the first reason that these dancers continue to dance is basically they want to dance. This is connected to their identity. If ballet dancers who are 35 years old have a hard time you know, not dancing anymore because they've spent their whole life doing ballet. Imagine what a 90-year-old must feel. His whole identity is being a dancer. I, and that's his entire life. That's what he's done. So the first reason that they're getting on the stage is obviously because they want to. Uh, there's still that, that desire for the stage, but there's other stuff. The, this heritage policy requires them to get on the stage or once per year, once per year, they have to do a, an important performance, or they have to become National Human Treasure Emeritus. And if you're an emeritus, you're not going to get money anymore. And if you're if you're Ime Bon, you've been a professor at Seoul National University, and you've earned plenty of money, and you have money in the bank. But if you're somebody with one of the unpopular arts, or a group art, something that you always had to share the performance fees and you didn't get many opportunities and nobody wanted to have you come teach at a prestigious university. Those people, they actually can find that stipend very useful. And for them, becoming human treasure emeritus means giving up something which could make a big difference. And Korea has not such a good pension situation. So, you know, there's, that is, is an, an issue as well. Um, I'm mostly just going to summarize through the end because um, apparently I talked too long in the beginning. Um, so third, performers have a responsibility to their protégés. So if you are a protégé of some performer, the only way that you can rise up is if your teacher continues to help you move up. And so your legitimacy is <coughs> is tied to the continued performance of your teacher. And so you are trying to get up to a point where you can survive on your own before your teacher you know, stops performing. So that's an issue as well. Um, and uh, fourth, um, although the stipend isn't that much money, if you're a national human treasure like Ime Bon, um, you can ask for some pretty big uh, lesson fees from your students. And so this can be a pretty big um, thing to attract people to continue on um, doing the, the art. Um, they're not going to get the lesson fees if they're not <coughs> still able to push people up through the system by nominating them for rank advancement. So you need to keep performing to keep your rank. And if you keep the rank, you get the stipend and you can get the lesson fees. So financial concerns. Um, the, the next, um, I'm just going to switch to a pretty slide. Uh, so, more email bomb. Um, so, the next uh, reason on why we see elderly dancing bodies in Korea um, as something that's important that we need to think about is aesthetics. Um, Basically, it comes down to this. Your teacher is really old, and your teacher's mobility is reduced, and your teacher is saying, do it like me. And your teacher is going on stage, and they are being held up as being the best dancer. And the audience is seeing somebody with reduced mobility. And pretty soon, the idea of traditional dance aesthetics has become more and more this heavier and heavier, slower and slower, and Korean dance does have a very important quality of heaviness in it. But I feel like it's moving more in that direction, that this, that the extreme elderly on the stage who are no longer to have as much lightness on, in their performance, that this does increase, increasingly push the aesthetics of Korean traditional dance into this sort of more um, heavier, slower, less lift, 
sort of thing. Um, so aesthetics. Um, and you know, we see a lot of that. Uh, the good example on this is. You guys have all seen the movie Self Contained, right? I mean, you, you have to. If you haven't, it's on YouTube. They have English subtitles. It's on the Korea Film Channel. Just go on there. It's on there. <coughs> the whole thing. On um, so Self Contained, we see uh, this Pansori singing father blind his uh, his protege daughter because he feels that the only way that she'll be able to uh, truly show suffering in her singing is through having experienced suffering herself. And she's not getting to suffering fast enough for him. So he figures he'll blind her, that'll you know, push her into the, into the suffering category enough. <laughs> um, so he does that. So it's, in, in Korea, we do have an aesthetic, this emotional aesthetic effect that can <coughs> really be communicated successfully by people with a Miss Korea face who are all like, <laughs> You know, that's not the aesthetic. That's not the traditional aesthetic. You've got to have this degree of heaviness, this degree of suffering within it. Otherwise, it won't work out. But, um, and so it's true that the elderly dancing body can actually bring a more meaningful performative significance on through the limitation of their body. Um, and I have this whole section where I talk about disability and, you know, now we're starting to have um, disabled bodies on stages, especially in modern dance, people <coughs> missing limbs or in wheelchairs, things like that. And to what extent is this a, a similar sort of thing? Rising past your disability, rising past age to still be able to, to dance. Um, so is the elderly dancing body being made into a spectacle? Um, so, uh, and then the, the final, um, thing that I, I look at with this is nostalgia. Nostalgia, this embodiment of the past. So maybe if I read my very best paragraph, uh, the desire for the authentic allows the knowledge and experiences of the elderly performer to function as a placeholder that trumps the erosion of physical competence. The participation of older performers brings a timeless connection between the pre-modern tradition and the urban stage in a way that younger performers are unable to replicate. The attraction of authenticity for a Korean traditional performance audience is supported by a close reading of the language in almost any um, performance uh, program. So, I was initially uncomfortable when Jin Oksa kept this elderly dancer on the stage and didn't let her leave the stage. Um, yet it seemed that other people in the audience had a different reaction. After the show, when I was talking with friends in the lobby again, um, no one else mentioned any discomfort or dissatisfaction with what had happened. Um, regular audience members may have seen similar presentations in the past. I, I had. Um, in, in December of 2010, when I saw Ime Bang's um, final full-length performance, audience witnessed him also being helped off the stage by a young woman after each of his dances. <coughs> um, a detail that I saw as a performative act, that I saw helping him off the stage as part of the performance, a performance of respect for the elderly, a reminder that uh, maybe he couldn't dance quite as well as when he could leave the stage on his own. This sort of unscripted but scripted performance is not only applauded, it's actually what people are looking for. People in that moment of Joe Gamya trying to leave the stage and Jin Ok Sup dancing with her and then Zhang Sai playing Gwengari for her at that moment, the audience was seeing something that they perceived as real. This was the backstage coming onto the stage. They were seeing, you know, uh, something that could have been hidden on a heightened level of authenticity compared to what had actually been prepared. So, 
In the two performance, as Jin Ok Sup prevented Jo Gam Nya from leaving the stage, the audience may have voyeuristically felt that Jin was facilitating their, their observation of a back space. Um, so the philosophies surrounding the performing arts transmission environment in Korea are actually encouraging this attitude that learning is never done. They're pushing performers on, to portray an inner emotional connection with the arts. And they continue to give elderly performers an opportunity for the stage long past when Western Europeans have retired on even from physically undemanding occupations. So this uh, combined with the history I've outlined above on, has led to a situation where actually the younger generation <coughs> is often prevented from engaging in the most thrilling starring roles or having the most opportunity for the stage um, because this central place continues to be occupied by their own teachers. So um, that's just a little bit of a complication of this whole thing that I want to leave you with as a, as a final thought. What about the younger people? When the older people are taking all of the opportunities, how do we raise up a new generation of Korean traditional dancers? So I know it's very jet lagged, but I hope you enjoyed my presentation.